Good afternoon and welcome to Axiom Medical's webinar today on the undetected safety threat uh, regarding sleep deprivation. My name is Scott Cherry. I'm Axiom Medical's Chief Medical Officer and I have Dr. Les Curte here with us as well. Usually you'll see Holly hosting this for us. She's ran into some technical difficulties, so I will be in her place uh, for this webinar. So I'm really looking forward to um, discussing with uh, Dr. Curte um, sleep, the importance of sleep, and um, the implications to um, safety and risk of injury. And so, um, again, I am Scott Cherry, Ax uh, Axiom Medical's Chief Medical Officer. My professional background, I'm a board-certified preventive medicine and public health physician. I've been supporting the U.S. military, the government, um, corporate and industrial operations for the past 15 years, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. And um, Dr. Curte, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. I don't mind at all. Thanks. Thank you. Um... And sorry to everyone that we're starting a few minutes late with uh, technical difficulties, but we will do do our best. Um, so I'm uh, I'm Dr. Les Curte. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. I'm currently senior VP for behavioral health at Axiom Medical. I've had uh, been spent the last about 20 years in um, occupational mental health, primarily in the disability and workers' compensation space and uh, have come to Axiom to help build um, programs here and uh, incorporate mental health into our offerings. Thanks, Les, for that. And, you know, today we're gonna be discussing sleep and I think of sleep as one of the most important pillars of um, wellness and uh, health and human performance. And so obviously the other pillars would be nutrition and exercise. And so, you know, today we're gonna really just um, discuss the science behind sleep, uh, stages of sleep, uh, consequences of sleep deprivation, um, and then some real life safety risk and um, unthinkable disasters that are really um, just huge events in our um, history. And then um, a discussion about implementing workplace safety uh, education sessions. And so you know, when I think of um, the science behind sleep, I heard a great, um, uh, I heard a great um, seminar on sleep, and this presenter talked about kind of the evolutionary need for sleep. And so, aside from all the science that looks into the importance of sleep, just evolutionary, we have not as a, a human species. Uh, devolved away from needing sleep. So we spend, you know, almost a third of our lives uh, sleeping. And so if you're thinking about uh, pre-civilization, when you literally need to be looking for food or protecting yourself, sleep would be a really huge disadvantage. So obviously there is some um, amazing things that happen during sleep that biologically we have not been able to evolve away from. And so I would just say from first principles, um, sleep is um, incredibly important. Um, and so we're gonna kind of talk a little bit more about the details and science, but um, you know, in many ways, um, there's so many things that happen during sleep. Um, you know, essentially it's an essential function like I spoke about. Um, and, and so in many ways, and, and there's Holly. I don't know if Holly, you, you can hear us. Um, I'll I can't, keep going. can you hear me? I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All yeah, right, yeah, my voice. I had some technical issues. Oh, yeah. No problem. We were able to kind of get through introductions and just kind of a, a kind of the Go agenda ahead. for today's webinar. Okay. So uh, okay. right, now, right. right now we're talking about the science behind sleep. And so, um, you know, there's lots of studies that show that, um, for instance, if someone is awake for 19 hours, um, they actually, uh, their behavior is similar to someone with a blood alcohol level of 
0.05 percent, which actually can be considered um, intoxicated in some states. So really, your cognitive and uh, executive functions like concentration, judgment, decision making, um, really are negatively impacted. And so if you take that study out a little further, um, if you're awake for 28 hours, you, your behaviors are similar to someone with a blood alcohol level of 0.1%, uh, which is very, very high. And so, um, you know, again, there's so many things that happen during sleep that can really negatively impact um, your performance. Um, you know, and then with the um, with sleep also, you actually process memories. So for students or in, uh, adults trying to, um, you know, study for exams, having really good sleep helps process memories um, and just learnings and, and things like that. So it, it you know, sleep is um, something that I would almost call as a, a miraculous medicine that is for free, but you know, um, when you think about how often people are sleeping, uh, the recommendation is between seven and nine hours, but there's many studies out there that show that um, at least half of Americans are getting well below, you know, six or seven hours. And so um, it, it really, I think now we have a culture of um, kind of a warrior mentality that we embrace um, working through uh, s sleep deprivation. I don't know if, Les, you have any comments about that, what, what you've seen in the past, or if um, if there's a way to kind of change that culture. But, um, you know, to me, it, it's been something that's consistent in all the organizations that I've worked in in the past. And yeah. it's really hard to break away from that because it's a subtle but very powerful cultural um, uh, value almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I, I think it almost became a badge of honor to be, to say that you're tired. It, it, you know, I've, I, I've certainly noticed that in, in corporate environments that it's like, it's kind of a, you know, you must be working really hard if you're if you're tired all the time. And of course, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about is all the difficulties that happen when you're tired, uh, cognitively and physically. So, but it, it it is interesting. Yeah, you know, and we'll talk about this later. But I think it's a good time to discuss it now. So, in in many ways, this is one of those cultural moments that almost need to be addressed from a top-down perspective, your senior leaders need to speak about their own personal experiences and how they manage this personally. It, this is one of the tougher things to do from a bottom-up perspective where, you know, it's a grassroots um, moment. And so, um, you know, again, we can talk a little bit more about that later on. Yep. Um, you know, so, you know, there's actually, you, you have to prepare to sleep and which is really frustrating in many ways, because I think of sleep as preparing me for my next day. But in your current day before sleep, you actually need to prepare. And so obviously a healthy diet is important for many reasons. But um, if you're eating a lot of um, processed foods, high in sugar, um, having caffeine within six to eight hours of bed, um, that can really um, negatively impact your sleep. In fact, you probably don't want to eat anything, you know, as long as possible before your sleep. Um, I've actually experimented with this personally, and, and I have dramatically better sleep when I'm kind of fasting for several, several hours before bed. And then also positive uh, lifestyle habits. We used to use the phrase um, sleep hygiene, which I know um, some of our clients may, you know, embrace industrial hygiene, which is kind of the maintenance of that industrial uh, mechanisms and things like that and managing workplace exposures. But um, you also want to have sleep hygiene where you try to go to bed the same time every day you're trying to sleep in a dark area with low noise and really use the bedroom only for uh, sleeping. 
and not necessarily having um, the TV on when you go to sleep or really minimizing now screen time uh, a couple of hours before sleep because the light emitted from your screens um, actually signal to your retina that you're in daytime. And so um, our eyes are actually part of our central nervous system and have really direct access to the hormonal uh, cascade in our brain for preparation of sleep or preparation of waking. So if you're looking at your cell phone in the middle of the night, it's giving your brain a mixed signal for, um, uh, you know, is this time to be waking up or is this time to still be sleeping? Um, you know, here is kind of um, just a high level overview of how we sleep. And there's actually four stages. I'm not going to go into detail too much, just knowing that um, you're kind of going through four different stages of light and deep sleep. And um, they all have kind of their purpose. Cycling this um, every 90 to 120 minutes. I wouldn't time to say that um, you want to be monitoring your sleep level. You a better, um, and I don't know if you can hear me or not, I'm having a little, little bit of um, issues seeing you guys. Um, can you? Yeah, your sound is breaking up a little bit, Dr. Cherry. Um. I'll see if you can get back, kind of a get get back to a more stable connection, and and um, I'll talk a okay. little bit about a uh, little bit about this, well, this hopefully cycle. That will pass. That, yeah. um, let me see if I can minimize my my bandwidth utilization here. Okay. Yeah, it might be our platform. Unfortunately, apologies to everyone. We're having some significant issues today and I think I think one of the things that we can say about this you know I, I think it's getting more and more common for uh, for those of us who are interested in sleep and and health generally you know there are um, uh, electronic electronic means of tracking stages of sleep. And one of the interesting things to do with them is it gives you a sense of how much time you spend in each of these. And the thing that we see the most is that, um, especially if there's a lot of light in the room, if there's light coming in from outside, if there's sound, um, we, get, um, we get a lot of, uh, we spend a lot of time in lighter sleep or in waking. So it looked, you think that you're getting seven and a half hours in the bed and it must be working okay and you're getting enough sleep. But in point of fact, if you take a look at it, you may not be getting enough deep sleep. Um, and that's, that's really one of the key indicators and one of the things that's useful to know about, about this um, sort of circadian rhythm that happens inside of sleep and we keep cycling through it. Um, uh, another kind of interesting phenomenon is that this cycle is typically around 90 minutes. Sometimes it's a little longer, sometimes a little shorter, but if you, but it'll tend to be pretty consistent by individuals. So one of the things you can do to help yourself with sleep is um, is to time your sleep so that you're towards the end of a cycle when you when you wake wake yourself up. So better sometimes if you can't get seven and a half, might be better to get six. Uh, even though that 
isn't the recommendation. Um, you know, the best bet would be seven and a half hours, but it, but it can make a difference. It, and you can experiment with that yourself to see when do you wake up the most refreshed and that's worthwhile mm -hmm. looking at. Looks like Dr. Yeah. Cherry's back. I think we can. Yeah, I think we're all back. Um, I saw that Jennifer Page had asked, um, asked one of you, how much time should you be in deep sleep? That was a great question. I saw that it came true there. Either one of you want to take that? Um, uh, my quick answer is that um, I've seen recommendations that really widely vary. In, you know, an hour to up to three right. hours it's it's not like the yeah that's true i think we may be losing you there for a second yep yeah i've yeah. seen i've seen recommendations of anything from from an hour to three hours okay. um i i would judge frankly i would and and the by the way the research in this is pretty widely widespread as mm -hmm. to how much difference it makes and what the right right amounts are i think the key th question is are you waking up refreshed oh, that's um, and if you're idea. not then you pay attention right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and you can always do things to minimize the amount of interfering interference you get with deep sleep light sound i, I was telling a story um before we before we went live, that when um, when our kids were little, and we had a lot of kids, the house tended to be pretty noisy. When I would travel, <laughs> I would have trouble sleeping because the house was because the yeah. hotel room was too quiet. And <laughs> if you have small children, yeah. quiet is a bad sign. Um, right. And right. So I had so to I had to actually create a little bit of white noise in order to be able to sleep well. So again, I I think that we tend to have this idea that there are rules about how to do this right, and there are general rules about minimizing light, minimizing sound, um, you know, sleeping at the same times. But the key thing really is to monitor yourself and 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 make sure that you're waking up refreshed. Hope that answers that question. I, it's probably not satisfying to say we don't know. Yeah, but definitely. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things that we'd seen at the bottom was that, was that they were kind of given a range. Was it? Right. The, you know, it was like 90 to, to 100 minutes, you know, for that full cycle so really changing and also with age is that you consider age to be a factor that could impact that as well that the older that you get sometimes the less sleep quality there is some pretty good evidence about that that as you get older you do okay with less sleep up to a certain point mm -hmm. and then you begin to need more again gotcha. um you know somewhere in somewhere in your 60s people begin to kind of increase the amount of sleep that they that they get and and it makes a difference in performance um, definitely so, yeah. go ahead well the other thing i was going to ask you about was you know kind of when you when you look at sleep deprivation and, and some of the things that kind of come to mind what are some of those consequences can you walk us through what those w would look like in terms of if you're not getting adequate sleep what are you at risk of or how is that going to impact your life Sure. So, so the general finding is overall slowed information processing. When you actually look at brain activity, it actually is slower in someone who is fatigued. And interesting, I came across another article that I just came across that looked at um, mental fatigue, even in the absence of being sleepy. Um, so they did a test where they taxed working memory. They did it. Uh, you had to use your memory to, to remember things and mm -hmm. then measured brain activity afterwards. And it was overall slowed. So there's more to it than just lack of sleep. But the general mm -hmm. finding is that we slow down overall. That means we can take in less information. Um, 
we tend to have, because we're taking in less information, there are attention lapses. Um, we have trouble processing that information and that delays our, our reactions. Um, mm -hmm. And there are also mood changes that tend to happen when sleep deprivation becomes chronic. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. feelings of depression, anxiety, um, irritability will increase the longer we are deprived from sleep. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that creates an issue. But of course, that has safety implications, right? If we're not mm -hmm. processing information well and our reaction times are slowed, uh, which is what exactly. led us to this webinar. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Talk us through then, uh, so that's the safety safety side of it. Can you talk us through then the, the health side of that, kind of what, what you may be experiencing long-term, some of those implications could be? Yeah, well, and, and you're looking at, you know, like uh, on the slide, you're looking at a, a listing of a number of things that, that are, can be inf impacted by um, sleep deprivation. There is a dose dependence, uh, so a dose response to it. So the longer you go sleep deprived, the worse the risk for these things. High blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, so a lot of cardiovascular risk, um, uh, obesity and type two diabetes, uh, there's an increased risk. Um, uh, poor mental health, uh, again, these feelings of anxiety, depression, irritability, which in turn can interfere with relationships, which can make those mental health symptoms worse. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little, just one, a quick thing about you know, early death, um, there's a very clear dose response relationship between sleep deprivation and what we call all cause mortality. So death for any reason, it tends to be cardiovascular, but it, it's actually a risk, it, sh it shortens lives. Um, mm -hmm. And we see it on sleep deprivation primarily, but we also see it in a highly excessive risk. Um, you know, correlations, not causation, meaning that there could be other reasons that we sleep too much that contribute to these factors. But we know that sleep is a really key factor in terms of long term health overall. And that includes risk of risk to life. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Sure. Yeah. Great. And maybe I'll just add a little bit, you know, and as I look at all these um, issues that are correlated with uh, poor sleep, the, the one thing that continues to keep kind of um, resonating with me is um, these are all um, health risks associated with systemic inflammation. And so, for instance, obesity, you can have someone who is doing almost everything right. They're exercising they've improved their diet, but if their sleep is not appropriate, their hormones or uh, profile that's being secreted is still in a stressful state with cortisol. Mm -hmm. And so your body will not, will hang on to its fat and it's really hard to lose weight. Uh, same thing with diabetes. Um, if, you're, if you're not sleeping while well, your cortisol, the stress hormone is very high. And so um, cortisol specifically makes you release um, sugar into the blood, which is what diabetes is. Um, you know, cortisol or stress is basically making the body ready to uh, f uh, fight or flight, so to speak. And so you need um, sugar or energy in your blood to be able to power your muscles. But it's great if a, a lion is chasing you, but if this is a chronic state of um, poor sleep and stress, then that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, and I think that's what speaks really to me less as you talk about early death and all cause, all cause mortality. Um, but the same thing with heart disease, um, you know, again, if you have all these inflammatory um, hormones and um, molecules, it's going to cause a lot of um, heart disease, which manifests um, either with heart attacks or stroke, high blood pressure. And then, um, you know, lastly, mental health as well. If, if your mind has um, 
uh, your brain has a lot of inflammation circulating. Um, I do think that's going to lead to kind of that um, fogginess, uh, difficult decision making, mm-hmm. all the things we talked about earlier with executive functioning. And so it, it's really, I think, um, sleep is an amazing medicine if we can get get good sleep in our bodies. Yeah, definitely. Hey, one thing I wanted to ask you about that it may not be on here, but but I was reading about it last night as well, was that the the correlation between um, the lack of sleep and the long-term impact and, and what that would have on dementia. Have you read anything about that or could you expand upon that a little bit more? I think what I was looking at, they were saying or explaining that if you have the um, deprivation tolerance. So, I mean, it's like your body has adjusted where you're only trying to work on maybe four hours. And, and so you're not getting those signals that your body is tired because you abuse it every day. And the long-term implication of that would be the dementia um, problems that would come along with that. Are you familiar with any of that, Dr. Cherry? Well, the things that resonate with me, um, is that, now there's this way of thinking of, of dementia and Alzheimer's as kind of a type three diabetes. So there's a metabolic dysregulation in the brain, um, mostly through glucose or uh, regulation or, or diabetes that is feeling that's a major risk factor for again, dementia. And so again, if sleep is directly contributing to um, higher levels of inflammation and potentially cortisol, that's going to dysregulate glucose metabolism. But we also realize sleep is so restorative to all of our cells and our brain cells are highly metabolically functional. I think um, they use almost the majority of our um, energy. People don't realize just using your brain, even if you're sedentary, uses a lot of energy. And so you your, your brain is so metabolically active that you do need that downtime uh, and especially sleep to restore those uh, vital cells. Mm-hmm. Les, did you have anything to add to that? No, I, th- I think that you, I, I, th- I think that's exactly right. And that also ties in with what you just said a minute ago about inflammation mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because, you know, inflammatory conditions, chronic inflammation is also associated with, the development of of dementia you know and what's really um i almost want to say fun but it's it's just very interesting but we all experience this if we um get terrible sleep or if we stay up all night our our own self judgment of our wellness is very low the next day um you know we're more sensitive to pain We are more reactive to our environment. Uh, I'll keep it politically correct. Um, (laughs) And so you almost don't need a study in the sense that, you know, we we all sense this. Um, And uh, as I said earlier, I've been tracking my my sleep for about three years now. And so um, I think it's one of the most important parts of our overall health. Definitely. Um, and Rosalind, I see your question that was there. I think we may cover that towards the end when we're talking about some of these, um, some of the safety procedures and how it is that you can do, you can roll out some of the education tools that are there. So we will definitely get back to that one. Um, but I wanted actually, and and I know this kind of seems dramatic, but whenever I was looking at, whenever we look at the topic and how it is that that we can approach this and, and the manner in which you can communicate mm-hmm. this on the level that your employees would understand, I personally, and I'm sure that that many of you would agree that if you can kind of paint that visual picture, help people understand what that looks like from a larger view, sometimes those stories that go along with that, that it helps you to understand just the impact of what this has and and what can go wrong, appropriate uh, amounts of sleep and taking care of your body. So I wanted to go through three different, three different um, historic events that occurred that have been traced back to sleep and kind of get both of your thoughts on what had occurred and how how this related to that. So the first one, um, Dr. Sherry, if you want to go through, I think this one was specific to the space shuttle, the Challenger explosion, explosion that had occurred. Yeah, you know, and I this was definitely um, very um, impactful to me personally because I was of the age where we were in um, school and we would watch the shuttle launches. So, um, 
you know, I, I think, and I was probably in elementary school or junior high. And so quite young, um, probably didn't know enough to know how bad it, or, you know, what an impact it was really, at least consciously. But, um, you know, I think many of us know that, you know, this was a catastrophic failure of, um, I believe it was an O-ring that was uh, sealing uh, some of the fuel compartments. But, you know, what's I think so important is doing investigations to find the root cause. And, and so this investigation uh, found that many of the um, most important people associated with the launch had really extremely poor sleep. And so, um, you know, I think that, um, having NASA actually admit that, um, you know, it's in some ways it's part of the culture to, to get things done um, through sleep deprivation. It's probably not as sustainable and it directly adds to um, the risk of, of the mission. And so now we've seen large corporations focus on fatigue risk management um, inherently, uh, at least to a degree, um, but again, I think this there's always deadlines that push everyone to um, kind of sacrifice sleep uh, in the name of uh, attaining a goal or the mission, you know. Yeah. That, that jumped out at me about this was that, you know, it wasn't necessarily that the that the astronauts that were in the, the shuttle are having a lack mm -hmm. of sleep, but it's those that are responsible for making some of these decisions, some that are responsible for monitoring um, all the things that are going on with, with the spacecraft, et cetera. Um, and it looks like that they, you know, I think one of them said that they'd only had like two hours. Um, they'd only taken a break for two hours prior to, to that launch at, at one. So it definitely has a large impact because that's a, a moment in history that you look at, you look back and you think, man, where did we go wrong? And and I agree with you. I think that, that the investigation piece of this and coming back and saying, hey, we dropped the ball here. Or, hey, we could have done something differently. It plays a big piece in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Can ahead. I add something to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think just go back for just a second to that previous slide, if you would. Just, I think that... Um, um, whoops, too far. <laughs> I I think that that um, I think that statement is really interesting, and I wanted to underline it because I think it this really talks about in addition to sleep that it's really part of an overall culture that you know rewarded working like heroic additional mm -hmm. efforts um, and lack of sleep was probably part of that culture, but it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, a lot of our customers talk about a safety culture. And I think it's really important to recognize that sleep is also part of a, of a more general environment in which it's important for us to emphasize safety. And sometimes you have to sacrifice certain other aspects of productivity to keep people safe. Good you know, point. it's a, it, there, there are sometimes a trade, and so I thought it was worth underlining for that because it's a, it's a bigger picture than just sleep, but sleep can mm -hmm. be an indicator of a larger set of problems. Agree completely. Yeah, Dr. Trey, talk to us about then the um, the oil spill. I, I think we probably all remember this one as well, and all the images of, of the wildlife and and how they were covered in the oil, etc. Yeah, you know, again, this was just a couple of years later. So, um, you know, what's interesting was, um, and it may be the timing of the presidential report for NASA, but it looks like it did not change for the, you know, Exxon Valdez, where, again, this super tanker um, spilled really a quarter million barrels of crude oil, um, with just absolutely huge environmental impacts. Um and, and, you know, what's interesting is that um, the root cause investigation there um, revealed that the third mate at the helm, which is kind of the steering wheel of the ship, um, you, you know, was actually sleeping. And, you know, a lot of these ships are have amazing automation to kind of like autopilot, but you still need someone actively kind of in charge and, and providing oversight of things. And so... Um, again, here, I think um, 
there's like uh, there's how things should be done, and then you have kind of emergency response, or um, you know, sometimes someone is uh, you know manpower is 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 short, and so everyone is pulling extra duty because um, these ships do not have a lot of people on them. Usually, it's probably less than twenty five or twenty. It's it's the total opposite of a cruise ship. They're just as big, but um, really have very few people. So if one person is sick for another reason, then everyone is pulling extra duty. But, you know, sleeping at the helm is really just a, a catastrophe. And it, it's a shame because it is preventable in, in many ways. And, you know, this is an absolutely huge catastrophe for the environment. But for the company, not many companies would be able to survive um, this type of catastrophic uh, failure just through uh, reputation and potentially fines. I know other um, oil and gas companies said that, you know, back in those days, if they had a similar incident, they would have not been able to survive. Uh, the business would not, would, would not have been able to survive. So really, these are huge issues that, um, you know, have touched um you know, a large part of the country and um, are very popular in the news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Holly may be frozen too. Um, yeah. You know, unless, unless you had something to put there, I, I was going to move on to our third large kind of incident. Um, yeah. And I actually worked in nuclear safety as my last army position. So, this has kind of um, been a. Um, this has been part of my training um, when I was um, in the military and, and providing support to a personnel reliability program. But um, you know, again, here uh, shift workers um, was kind of the attribution where um, there was a lack of attention and decision making, timely decision making that did not allow the, the plant to be detected um, losing coolant and then these um, reactors overheated. And, you know, collectively, these are three huge, um, massive catastrophes. But I think what's more insidious is actually the small things that um, are near misses or small or small, small um, errors that really don't go um, noticed until maybe a bunch of them compile together and then make one big catastrophe. And so a lot of the ways we have addressed COVID with a multi-layered approach, I know um, safety programs do the same thing. It's called that Swiss cheese model. So they're looking for multiple layers, but you could almost think of as uh, sleep as being the foundation, one of the foundations for high reliability programs because Essentially, if if your if your um, organization is is sleep deprived, that just opens up so many holes for for near misses or real errors that can happen. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth adding that um, you know a lot of what I came across as I was as I was looking for you know current see what current literature is. A lot of them had to do with sleep deprivation associated with shift work and excessive shifts and medical errors. Mm -hmm. um, and often, fortunately, those medical errors are small, uh, but small errors can can also add up. And you know, that's a to me that was a glaring example of you know what happens when people are chronically sleep deprived partly because mm -hmm. of the way that the shifts are set up and partly mm -hmm. because we've been in a crisis and everybody's working really hard. Yeah, yeah you know, I think it's it's really almost uh, a multi-systemic uh, um, effects to where, you know, I think we've talked about the brain and, and with regard to safety, but, you know, I know COVID is still on people's mind and there's actually both, Pre-COVID, there's studies that show if you're sleep deprived, your vaccine doesn't work as well. And this isn't for COVID vaccination. This is for other vaccines. But what happens essentially is with that inflammation, as it comes up, it actually suppresses your immune system. We actually give patients uh, cortisone 
to decrease inflammation, but that your inflammation is actually your immune system. And so um, there's also an increased risk for cancer with sleep deprivation too, that uh, mm -hmm. the IARC uh, has classified. It's the International Agency for Research of Cancer, I believe. And so really, mm -hmm. um, sleep is gonna in impact every um, organ system in our body. And, um, you, you know, I think many industries are starting to change medical training. When I was a medical resident, um, my internship was especially brutal where we really did not sleep at all for, um, you know, a full day every five or six days. And I know that's drastically changed, which is a good thing. Um, but I think that's the case for every, uh, not just medical residents, but, but for, for people doing shift work, over time, mm -hmm. I know some organizations um, have rules that you can't be up for 20, 20, you know, two or three shifts in a row. But sometimes when you look at the root cause investigation, there, there, there's those exceptions that happen. So, um, you know, it, it's a tough balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, kind of how we wanted to, to wrap all of these pieces together with a bow at the end here before we jump into some of the questions was really to give an understanding of, of some ideas of how it is that you can take this information and bring it back to your individual workplaces. Um, Dr. Corte, I'm going to come to you first and just kind of ask you um, with a science background as well and, and you understanding communication and, and how all the um, what people respond to best, maybe from a, from a training perspective. Talk us through what your ideas are of how it is that you can take a concept like this and bring it back to your workforce and have them recognize the significance of what this danger is. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to talk in in you know kind of general principles here because one of the things that um, I think is really important is you know to do an um, industry by industry, but all work site by work site analysis and kind of look at, you know, what are the patterns mm -hmm. in the culture? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, number one here is your employees want to hear from you. Um, your employers also want to be heard. And so the place that I always suggest starting is to, is to find out what your employees are experiencing in terms of sleep, fatigue, um, you know, look at the level of anxiety they're experiencing. You know, we know that, for example, you know, anxiety about about your job will interfere mm -hmm. with sleep. And of course, sleep interference will tend to make anxiety worse. So learning about that first, I think, is a really important intervention. And then mm -hmm. communicating back, especially in terms of, um, you know, what you heard from your employees and put it in context of what that can mean in terms of safety in examples that are relevant to the workplace. So if I were doing this in a, in a healthcare setting, I would be talking about medical, about medical mistakes, simple things, you know, um, there are, you know, I've never been in a workplace where there weren't like simple mistakes that pe kept popping up um, mm -hmm. that everybody knows about. And we know that those are likely to be worse with sleep deprivation. Using those examples is probably a good, uh, is probably a good intervention. Um, certainly if you have the, the resources to make um, wearables that track sleep available, um, that is an intervention that, although maybe pricey, could save a huge amount of money. And, and here's the thing. It doesn't really matter how accurate those wearables really are. Um, what matters is that people who wear devices, like a watch, people who wear devices that, that help you track how you're sleeping and other, and other things, simply tracking it tends to make people pay attention, which improves the pattern. That is an excellent um, point. Mm -hmm. And so and so just talking about it in the workplace in 
in terms that are understandable to the workers and asking about it will by itself mm -hmm. tend to have a positive impact because you're addressing the issue and it makes people pay attention. Um, mm -hmm. I did see a question, you know, about, you know, is there a video that we can use? And, uh, you know, my answer to that one is I, I don't know of one offhand that does it well, but I am happy to go look um, mm -hmm. and provide that, you know, provide that information. Um, so that's where I would start. Ask okay. and then feedback and mm -hmm. shape interventions in such a way that people begin to pay attention to their degree of restfulness. Um, and I'm sorry, I did think of one other thing. There's a lot of discussion in the literature about catnaps and the benefit of 15 minute naps, um, which interestingly enough has a better impact on performance than a 50 minute nap because there's a lot of inertia coming out of sleep if you mm. sleep for longer, mm -hmm. right? Catnaps and providing space for that. If you're in a work environment where that's appropriate, providing space for that can be a really effective intervention in revitalizing people throughout the course of a day, especially if people have to work longer shifts. Mm -hmm. could, could I interject just real quickly? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Especially, I think, Les, it's a, it's a great segue. Um, you know, military training is also very sleep depriving. When I was at boot camp, uh, I think we got 15 minutes of sleep the first day, and then it was about three to four hours every day subsequent. Um, this was back in, you know, 1991 or so, but um, when Les and I were working on this webinar together, we came across, um, actually the military now has um, a training manual um, for uh, special forces and, and probably for all military members that actually address napping as a, a very important way to uh, fatigue risk manage. And so obviously at war, um, you know, you don't have a lot of choice, but you may be able to do 15 minute naps that may be doable at certain times. And so I think that's incredibly powerful uh, sign uh, from the military uh, community to corporate communities and, in, uh, you know, and industries that, you know, if, if the military is willing to allow for naps, it may be very critical for um, the private sector. So um, mm -hmm. I think the, the manual came out just a couple of years ago. And so I used to live and die by those certain manuals that apply to occupational medicine. And so it was really amazing to see that in the military manuals now. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We had some additional questions. I saw that we had some that were here for the town hall piece, but then we also had some that came in throughout the throughout the event and that I wanted to get your, your take on. Let's see, Mark was asking about um, issues with dreaming to the point that it keeps me awake at night and can I do anything to help me not dream so much? Either of you want to take that one? Um, wow. Um, really good you question. know, I, it's a great question, and I don't know how to answer it on an individual basis mm -hmm. because there are so many things that can contribute to it. So there are certain kinds of sleep disorders. Um, uh, narcolepsy comes to mind. But there are, there are certain kinds of sleep disorders that will result in excessive vivid dreaming, which can actually then interfere with sleep. So you're getting a lot of sleep, but it's not very good quality. So that's one thing that comes to mind. Anxiety will do that. Um, you know, anxious, increased anxiety will tend to increase dreaming and and the dreams will tend to be disturbing. They're kind of. I call them anxiety dreams. I, I always say it didn't. I didn't have to go become a PhD in psychology to interpret a dream in which, you know, I'm being chased down the hallway and um, and I can't find a way out. Right. Um, so the answer to that question depends a lot on what's the 
what's the underlying, you know, what's going on under underlying and it could be physical or it could be mm-hmm. psychological. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then the solution varies, of course, depending, you know, there are medical mm-hmm. treatments for sleep disorders. There are medical treatments for things that interfere with sleep or that may increase dreaming. There are certainly brief psychological interventions that can make a difference in anxiety and things that would be contributing. So I, mm-hmm. it, it's always unsatisfying when you get one of those answers that's like, well, you know, it depends, but yeah. um, it's the best I've got. Yeah, the only thing yeah. I would add just quickly is if it just happens occasionally, you know, who knows if you should really address it, but if it's something that's consistent, that's affecting your quality of life, then maybe reach out to a professional. And if it's a false uh, positive, they can tell you that. And, you know, but if it's something that's consistently affecting you, then it's always worth at least uh, contacting a professional to get like individual advice on it, you know? Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Rosalind, I, we will look for a video for you. I, I think what I loved most about your your question was that you were asking, how is it that we can reach parents that can then teach kids? And that just really stuck out to me because it's like we have and they're coming. Um, We need to to establish some of these practices that will shape our lives forward. So we definitely will look for some resources for you and we'll, t- we'll touch base after this. Um, we, we had one question that was there in the town hall piece that was asking about wearable technology. And then I also saw that we had another question that came in. Um, let's see. I think it was George that was asked about wearing technology to bed or having And I think you both touched on this previously where you talked about that there's value just in having that, whether it's it's actually accurate or not. Is, is there any concern about utilizing that type of technology? And do you see that that, that be an employment type of um, setting moving forward, kind of as preventative measure? You know, I'm not aware of any um, studies that have shown kind of a, negative health effects from having your phone, you know, uh, kind of in the bedroom or in the, um, you know, near your bed um, from a health effects perspective. Um, But I do think there is clear benefit in tracking your um, sleep just just based Mm -hmm. on what, you know, Dr. Curte said about um, kind of the Hawthorne effect, where if you measure it, it'll probably just improve just on the basis of that. I've been tracking mm-hmm. mine, so at least I have a sense of when it's really bad or just poor. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But it, it, it's kind of like having a speedometer in your car to where, you know, you may be <laughs> speeding, but at least you know you're speeding. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah, it's a conscious decision to do that. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Right. Yeah. And I even noticed, you know, Chuck is wearing the, um, I, you guys may have seen Chuck on some of the webinars before. Um, he is our chief legal officer, but he wears one of those, the rings. It's. It's the, I forgot what the name of it is, but anyways, yeah, yeah. And so anyways, it's just a ring that you wear and it tracks, tracks health information there as well. Um, Yeah. So just kind of wrapping this up, I know it's kind of been a little bit scattered with, with the technical issues that we've had. Uh, My sincere apologies about that. Um, Kind of comes with the territory sometimes, but um, just to circle back and ask, is there any final thoughts that you want to close with Dr. Cherry or Dr. Perte? Um, moving forward and and to put sleep kind of at the the front to focus on within the workplace? Well, I did really appreciate that question about dreams. Um, But I think um, in general, it's it's about at least being aware or conscious of your sleep patterns. And so, you know, at least just do the I'm going to bed at 10 and I'm waking up at seven kind of as a minimum. Mm -hmm. But if you can get even some apps do really well where it's not wearable, but they'll listen to you if you're snoring and they can kind of sense if there's movement. (laughs) But I think sleep is, again, one of the most important things you can really do to impact your health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Dr. Corte, anything you want to add to that? Um, I, you know, I, I think I'll just, uh, go back to the question of, you know, it's, I think we're at a place now, you 
know, as we start to, I feel like I'm superstitious. I should knock on wood by saying, you know, as COVID seems to be winding down as a general concern, we're starting to really look at, you know, how are people doing in the workplace? And I think that that set of questions are, mm -hmm. um, it, it is really, really important. Like, how are people sleeping? How are they feeling? How are they doing emotionally? Um, you know, all of those questions, I think, begin to be important. And I'm really glad to see that we're starting to be able to talk about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I did want to bring to your attention before we uh, before we close here is that in the very beginning, I don't know, Dr. Sherry, may have, you may have covered it since I'm at the very top, but next in two weeks, so it will actually be on the 31st. And so that event that we are going to be hosting, um, it is going to con it is going to combine both stress and substance abuse into one event and kind of look at the, the relationship there. Um, those usually have a really good intra uh, turnout in terms of attendance. So you guys, if you would like to uh, press that button, the register now button, that'll get you signed up for that. You don't have to enter any additional information, but we definitely wanted to extend the opportunity to you guys first. Um, and you simply do that. It's there on your webinar call. Console. It's right there at the right at the top. Um, and so you just press the register now button. It would send your registration information to you. So we hope that we will get to see you there for that one. Um, in addition, you're always welcome to send us questions um, in a scenario like this or a type of setting like this. I know it's hard to get to some of all of them all the time, but we definitely are interested in what you have to say. We want to hear, we want to know your questions. We want to know what you're interested in, what topics that are of interest that you'd like to see us put some education around as well within the new year. So again, I appreciate all of you joining us today. It's been fantastic, great information. I love the feedback that we've gotten. Um, from some of you that have written in talking about the, the discussion of sleep and how important it is to, to your individual health. Um, and we look forward to seeing you then in two weeks. Thank you.